Hey there, Jared Postal here from bearsmart.com. And uh, today we are honored to have grizzly bear expert uh, Jeff Galis with us. Jeff is joining us live via Skype all the way from Missoula, Montana. Originally from Calgary, Alberta, Jeff has a master's in environmental studies. He's an award-winning writer. He's the author of the 2010 book titled The Grizzly Manifesto, as well as his very recently released book titled Little Black Lies. Jeff has also uh, published a report on the state of grizzly bears in Canada for the David Suzuki Foundation uh, titled Securing a National Treasure, Protecting Canada's Grizzly Bear. We're honored to have Jeff here. Here's what he has to say. Jeff, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us here today at Bearsmart.com. My pleasure to be here. Good, good. I want to talk a little bit today about your grizzly bear report. And uh, in the opening sentence of your study, you call the grizzly bear a uh, the national symbol of the Canadian wilderness. Why is the grizzly bear uh, that symbol? Well, the grizzly bear has long been an icon or symbol for wilderness, especially in the uh, North American West. And uh, and the reason for that is pretty simple, that um, grizzly bears uh, historically have not persisted long in places where um, human activity, particularly industrial and residential development, takes place. In a sense, they require wilderness um in order to survive over the long term so they so from a ecological perspective you know they they require wilderness uh for their their very being um and i think there's also a cultural component of that because but whether it's first nations people or contemporary uh, society i mean we don't see grizzly bears in uh, anywhere but in wild areas so um they have uh, sort of embedded themselves in our cultural imagination as being wild creatures of the wilderness. Yeah, yeah. totally. totally. Uh, can, uh, you, can, can you explain you to, our explain viewers to our viewers what an umbrella species is? And uh, what does that tell us about the plight of grizzly bears and conservation in Canada? Sure. Well, an, an umbrella species is a, is a species that if we meet their biological and ecological needs, it will then take care of the uh, needs of a variety of other species. So if you, if you picture an umbrella, you can, you can almost uh, see the grizzly bear holding up the uh, umbrella and then underneath it are dozens of other species. So where grizzly bears are allowed to persist, so too are um, other species, whether they're uh, rodents or ber birds or uh, other large carnivores, and uh, where their needs are met, so too are, is the health of the entire ecosystem. So by managing for grizzly bear persistence, we're not just managing for grizzly bears, we're man managing for ecological health. And from a management perspective, um, many of the places where grizzly bears persist and where we want them to persist yeah. Yeah. Um, are the headwaters of our water sources. And the same things that uh, put grizzly bears at risk like roads, uh, high road densities, also can imperil things like uh, clean and abundant um, drinking water right. and what for agriculture. So um, that, I think, just speaks to the importance of grizzly bear conservation, not only for grizzly bears, but for a whole suite of other things that we value. Yeah, yeah. yeah. totally. And what, what's the distribution of grizzly bears in Canada right now? And uh, are there areas of special concern where numbers are, uh, we're seeing a, a, a large decline in number of, of grizzly bears? Yeah, I mean, grizzly bears um, occupy most of British Columbia, um, the western, uh, uh, the southwestern part of Alberta, um, they go down in the United States, obviously in peninsular populations, um, in um, northern, northwestern Montana, northern Idaho, 
and northeastern or northwestern, pardon me, Washington, and uh, all, most of the Canadian North uh, still maintains uh, populations of grizzly bears. Yeah, and there's right. even there's even been some uh, recent uh, expansion of grizzly bears, for instance, in the northern Manitoba, where they haven't been seen in a hundred years. So. Yeah. Um, but it's mostly Western and Northern um, Canada. Right, right. And, I see, and, and where where are they most vulnerable right now? Well, there there are pockets here and there in the north where um, there's some problems with excessive uh, mortality. But by and large, the most threatened populations are where we'd expect them to be on the edges of. Uh, contiguous grizzly bear habitat, and that is western Alberta and southern BC. Right, right. Now, the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada has recommended that the government uh, recategorize grizzly bears as a species of special concern under the Species at Risk Act. Uh, what will this reclassification of grizzly bears actually do for the grizzly bear? This is not the first time that COSIWIC has designated grizzly bears as a, a species of special concern. Yep. Um, th they, uh, they did this last time, uh, 10 years ago, when they reevaluated the status of grizzly bears, but the federal government chose not to add it to Schedule 1 of the Species at Risk Act, uh, as they did polar bears. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's been an ongoing um, source of concern, I guess you could say, for COSIWIC. The benefits of listing it on Schedule 1 as a species of special concern are that uh, the federal government will, will be required to um, develop a management plan for grizzly bears where SARA applies. And that, unfortunately, that's only on those lands uh, managed by the federal government, but that does include national parks. Right. So I think there'll be more oversight on grizzly bear um, population health in and around national parks. And uh, one of the places that comes to mind where that would be important is Banff National Park, yeah. where they're having ongoing problems with high levels of grizzly bear mortality as a result of the highway, the railway, and uh, what appears to be accelerating um, uh, in industrial tourism uh, development in the park. Right. But I, I think the bigger issue is, is, is a symbolic one, that the federal government needs to recognize that grizzly bears continue to be at risk um, in much of their range in Alberta and British Columbia. And what we're really seeing is a continuation of the historical pattern where um, grizzly bears be, um, are reduced to these peninsular populations that then become islands, um, and island pop populations of small numbers are increasing risk of uh, extirpation or ext local extinction. Right. And, right. and that's how they disappeared from most of the... Uh, continental United States, at least in the western half of uh, the United States. So right, right. Um, I think it's really important that the federal government and the western provincial governments um, begin to make more concerted efforts to uh, ensure that we don't see any more declines. Because that's what policy says, right. uh, is that we, we want to keep grizzly bears everywhere they are today. And yeah. that's been clear for the last 20, 30 years, yeah. and uh, we haven't been doing as good a job as we can. Yeah. Uh, here in Whistler, we've heard uh, some news this spring of a female grizzly bear named Power, who's uh, moved south uh, out of her normal region into the Garibaldi Pit region. Uh, what sort of, does this give uh, bear researchers any sort of hope towards a resurging bear population, or is this just sort of a strange thing that happened? Well, I, I think it's a symbol of the possibility um, of the kinds of success we could hope to have if we were serious about recovering and maintaining grizzly bear populations. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I don't want to uh, downplay the importance of, of that uh, 
um, particular bear moving uh, into the Garibaldi pit region uh, because up until recently there were thought to be no bears there and now I understand that there's power which is an ironic name for a bear considering that these run of the river power projects are uh, yeah, yeah. of great concern to biologists yeah. Um, yeah. because they tend to bring more industrial development into wild areas that and will therefore put grizzly bears at risk yeah. but the fact that grizzly bears um, what what it tells me is grizzly bears are very resilient. Right. If we give them half a chance, they can um, repopulate the landscape and uh, enhance their numbers. But let's keep in mind that in the Yellowstone ecosystem, which, which in the United States, which I think is one of the great grizzly bear conservation success stories of of the 20th century, yeah. they started out with about 130 bears and and uh, 40 years later, they're now at 600 bears and uh, are deciding whether or not the, the bear should be delisted from the Endangered Species Act. Um, when we're talking about one, two, or three bears in a population unit, it's still functionally extinct in, in the sense that um, such a low number of bears is at a continuous high risk of extirpation. Yeah. So yeah. it will take a great deal of effort on behalf of the people of British Columbia to um, turn this seed into a viable grizzly bear population. Yeah. It, it yeah. absolutely can be done, yeah. Yeah. but it's going to require us to change the way we do business and to yeah. pay more yeah. attention. Yeah. yeah. Now, in, in, in your um, in, in the study, you... Um, point to Sweden and Norway, which also had about 130 bears left in in population in the 1930s, yep. and has seen seen it rebound to about 2,500 animals right now. Uh, are there uh, methods that BC and Alberta can adopt uh, and borrow from Sweden and Norway? Well, it's difficult to compare to Sweden, and it's largely Sweden because Norway, although Norway has grizzly bears as well on in the in western Norway, just it's similar to Alberta and BC. Sweden right. has most of the bears, yeah. and Norway hasn't allowed the grizzly bear population to rebound because they have different policies and more agriculture, okay. and um, are not as bear friend that are not as bear friendly. Um, but it's. I, I think um, there are some cultural differences between uh, uh, Scandinavian countries and uh, the North American West that I think um, probably play into that. Yeah. Um, but I think in general, it's um, reducing the re reducing the amount of people with guns that are um, in grizzly bear habitat. Um, and reducing the number of conflicts between people and bears. Yeah. And the the thing with Sweden is most of the people li live in southern Sweden where there aren't bears, and right. where there are bears is very low population densities. Yeah, yeah. That's not quite the same as western Alberta and southern BC. Of course. So yeah. I think that the better analogy is, say, northwestern Montana. Yeah. Uh, where they, where grizzly bears again have th thrived in the northern continental divide ecosystem. Yeah. There's now about a thousand bears, which is probably three times as many as there were when it was listed under the Endangered Species Act. Yeah. And uh, to me, one of the great signs of hope is that they're now moving out on the Great Plains um, as far east as Fort Benton, where they haven't been seen in 150 years. Wow. And, and people are tolerant of them. So they've, they between the state of Montana and the federal government in the U.S. and and the people who live in the region, they've built tolerance for grizzly bears. Yeah. They they've elim they've worked with landowners to eliminate attractants um, that lure bears to their doom, and they've protected or managed lands so that grizzly bears can survive, and that includes limited industrial development low road densities, and it's been extraordinarily successful. Now, you've, you've mentioned road densities 
a number of times throughout this interview. And um, can you explain the, the, the issue with roads going through uh, grizzly bear habitat? Sure. Um, well, there's a couple things. Historically, we, we know, and this has been well documented, that grizzly bear populations tend not to persist when road densities get over a certain threshold, which is somewhere around a mile per square mile or 0 0.6 kilometers per square kilometers. And, and that's largely because roads bring pe people, uh, roads allow motorized access, which allows more people to go into grizzly bear habitat, which increases human bear conflicts and results in too many dead bears. Right. Grizzly right. bears have a very low reproductive rate, so even um, a mortality rate of just 4% of the population or greater will, will start to drive the population down. Right. Right. And it would be nice if we could build as many roads as we want in grizzly bear habitat and just teach people how to behave well in bear country and not poach bears and not leave their garbage out and not um, get bring bears into conflict with people. But because of the grizzly bear's low reproductive rate, just a few bad apples with firearms can decimate a grizzly bear population. Yeah. And we've seen that time and time again. And there's that one example of that, of that bear um, up in the Whistler or Little Wet area that was poached yeah, it's a couple of years ago, yeah. right? And that's just an example of what happens, and that's part of the cultural difference between Sweden and and uh, the Western North America is there tend not to be people running around with rifles yeah. in Sweden. They yeah. have a totally different relationship with hunting and firearms and and even motorized recreation yeah. Um, yeah. than we do here in North America. Right. And and how does uh, how do projects like the Northern Gateway impact? Is it similar impact? Well, the, it, yeah, absolutely. It's going to create all kinds of industrial development through some pretty wild places where that are secure now for grizzly bears. And, you know, in order to build a pipeline, you're going to have to build roads into places that don't have roads, and places that do have roads will have increased traffic, and then you'll have, you know, um, industrial centers for pipeline maintenance and yeah. so on with more people, and, and it will definitely create problems for grizzly bears in some areas now that are pretty important. Um, the troubling thing is that during the Northern Gateway environmental assessment process and the hearings, it became clear that the BC provincial government didn't even do an assessment of or require Enbridge to do an assessment of the impact of the pipeline on grizzly bears. Right. And so in the COSIWIC report, um, the authors added that they were very concerned about the, imp the potential impact of the Northern Gateway pipeline. Well, and, uh, and and then throughout your report, you say that Alberta and Br British Columbia have made no meaningful progress towards protecting grizzly bear populations. In your understanding, what does meaningful progress actually mean, and who are the major players in making that happen? What's the timeline? Those th that kind of thing. Well, since about 1990 in Alberta and 1995 in British Columbia, there have been policy documents that clearly articulate um, the status of grizzly bears, the threats, the potential solutions, and you know how to deal with the problem. So in British Columbia, there's something like nine grizzly bear population units that are listed as threatened. None of those have a recovery plan yet, even though in 1995, it was uh, it was uh, articulated that they all needed recovery plans and that those recovery plans uh, needed to be implemented. Right. In Alberta, they did list the grizzly bear as threatened and they did develop a recovery plan, but there were not, none of the meaningful um, components of the recovery plan, which includes limiting industrial development, limiting road densities, um, have been implemented. So. Right. It's a lot of the talk and log syndrome, yeah. which is the thing I think 
British, some British Columbians are, are familiar with, where we continue to articulate articulate that we we care about grizzly bears, we value them, we want to keep them on the landscape, we understand the science, we understand the management implications, and yet we're not implementing them. Right. One of the great opportunities is, in fact, in the Sea to Sky LRMP, which is where the Garibaldi pit, um, uh, Squamish, um, what are the other two, uh, uh, Stein the Hat Latch, um, grizzly bear population units are, which are highly threatened, small populations. Um, they're in the Sea to Sky LRMP, which was completed, one of the tasks that needs to be completed as part of that process is developing a recovery plan or for all four of those grizzly bear population units right. or, or, or separate recovery plans for each of those units. Right. And we've yet to see that come to pass. Would an integrated recovery plan be better than a single recovery plan for each of those units? Uh, yeah, I think in, 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 that, in that area, it would make sense to do one recovery plan for all four units because, you know, we've recently seen that grizzly bears are starting to move around and cross the highways. And one of the essential components of, of a recovery plan for that region will be to maintain or restore connectivity um, between those areas. So doing it as one unit, where which will see, uh, say, crossing structures over the highways or limiting development in key corridors, yeah. uh, which Clayton Apps research has identified uh, before they become... Um, before they get developed, because once they're developed, they're blocked for good. Okay, it's yeah. okay. difficult to turn the clock back, yeah. but if we plan ahead, we can have healthy economies, we can have uh, robust employment, and we can have grizzly bears on the landscape. Good, good. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, your work is important. You're giving, giving grizzly bears and bears a real voice. And, uh, and we want to take it beyond giving them a voice and into that implementation. And uh, so thank you. You can connect with Jeff at jeffgalis.com. Correct. And uh, you can find his books there, his blog, his social media channels. And uh, if you want to read his report on the grizzly bears uh, in Canada, you can uh, please visit the David Suzuki Foundation or davidsuzuki.org. And yeah. we'll provide all the links below for that. Uh, thanks for watching. Hit the thumbs up. Hit the subscribe button. And please pass the video along. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Yeah. Talk soon. Yeah, and ha hats off to Bear Smart uh, for doing all the great work they do in BC. They're a real positive uh, voice for, for bears of all sorts in British Columbia. Right on. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Take care. See you later.